So gases are the most free out of all of the different states of matter we learn. If you compare them to solids and liquids, you're going to have a, they're, they're compressible. That's the main thing. Compressibility means they have a large space between them. They move very fast and they have a force on the inside of their container, which is called the pressure. And this pressure um, is what makes them different. And we're going to be utilizing pressure in the equations today. So compressibility is very important. So now we're going to jump right into this idea of how gases behave. It's called the kinetic molecular theory of gases. And those of you who are trying to catch up with the notes, don't worry too much about it. You can, the video is going to be posted and everything like that. So uh, just understand, think about it and just, just sit back and, and watch it and just try to grab stuff. So the kinetic molecular theory of gases basically describes how gases behave. And there's certain aspects of gases that are very important. And here are they, here are them. First is that gas particles are in constant motion and they're very fast. Um, if you remember the first day of class, I said that the average velocity of an air particle, air gas, air gas, meaning O2, N2, H, uh, H2O, vapor maybe, uh, H2, argon, is approximately 0.5 kilometers per second. So that's really fast. And they all move in straight lines for the most part. And then secondly, the attraction between the gas particles is negligible. So what we call most of these gases is inert. So they don't really exhibit any kind of attraction or repulsion forces from one another. We could, this is mostly true. Sometimes there's some slight, or slight attraction forces, which is called a, a um, induced dipole or a van der Waals force, which, or, which is fine. But if we want to use these equations, we have to assume that they don't react at all, which is a fair assumption for the most part, since they're moving very quickly very transient interaction, if any. So the third one, when gases hit each other, which they're hitting each other all the time, since there's billions of particles between me and you, these collisions we consider to be completely elastic, meaning their momentum and their kinetic energy is conserved from before the collision to after the collision. So we're gonna be talking a lot today about kinetic energy. So if you remember from physics, you have one half mv squared. That still applies here. And we're going to see relationships between kinetic energy and different types of gases and velocities in different types of gases. And you'll see there's a, there's a distribution. There's a distribution involved with that. Fourth, there is a lot of empty space between the gas particles compared to their size. Now, this is very important. So we're going to be talking about this standard condition of gases today called STP, which means a standard temperature pressure condition. And this, that's a, a defined condition as the temperature of zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin and a pressure of one ATM. Now, at this specific condition, we can say that every gas, no matter what the identity of the gas is, hydrogen, which is very small, or argon gas or, or uh, or fluorine gas or bor bromine gas, which is big, no matter what the identity of the gas is, the volume of one mole of that gas at this standard condition is exactly 22.4 liters every single time, regardless of how big the gas is. And this kind of ties into the effect that the space of the space between the gas particles is so large compared to their size that their size is almost negligible even if the pressure is pretty great between the particles or between in the container, even though the gases would be in a large pressure, the gas particles will be closer together to each other. Even if they're really close together, the space between them at that high pressure is still negligible compared to their size. So we should have kind of an understanding of how small these molecules are based on our talks about the mole, right? So, and that kind of ties into that where the space is going to be large. And this, by large, I mean, millimeters on at the highest really but you know these things are picometers and angstroms we're talking about so is hundreds of thousands and millions of times the difference so yeah and a lot of these things we kind of knew already we can be it's kind of like an, oh oh duh of course gases behave like that so here's pressure so the pressure the definition of pressure is the force per unit area that a gas exerts 
on its container. And if you, we're gonna be learning how pressure is manipulated. So one example we're gonna be using is the piston. So what a piston is, and I'll draw one right here, is you have a cylinder. Oh, that's an eraser. You got a cylinder. And you have this other free floating cylinder that's on top, that fits perfectly inside the cylinder. And there's some gas particles inside. This cylinder is, this little disc is free floating on the cylinder. That disc can go up and down. If this disc goes down, it will push these gas particles closer together, forcing them to have a higher pressure. It will decrease their, they will decrease the surface area and it will increase the force, meaning increasing the pressure. At the same time, it'll also decrease the volume. So, but yes, yeah, so and then you can do the opposite. You can do the opposite and you can decompress the piston, giving the gas molecules more room to breathe decreasing the pressure because the force on the pistons decreased and specifically about volume, the volume will then increase at the same time. This is called Boyle's law. That's the first law, the inverse proportionality between volume and pressure. So, so yeah. Okay. So this is a very important slide that I added, which talks about the units. The units are going to be a little bit different because we're, in, we're uh, introducing a new one and a, a new constant as well. So pressure, pressure is measured. There's four main units for pressure. The first one is the SI, well, technically the SI unit is Pascal's, but our standard in chemistry, we use ATM. So kind of like how liters it's, or for volume, it's not liters, it's cubic meters, but we use liters, but anyway, ATM is the main standard for like our atmosphere of pressure. It means one atmosphere. So right now we're about experiencing one atmosphere of pressure. If we were in the ocean and we have the entire ocean weight down on us and we would be experiencing a lot more pressure, depending on how deep you are, might be two, three, four, whatever ATM. If we're on the, we're in Colorado, up on a mountain somewhere, the pressure is going to be less because there's going to be less air stacking up on you if the higher you are, if you're a mile up. So the pressure changes, but the average atmospheric pressure at sea level is about one ATM. So one ATM, what it does is it makes this, it makes mercury in a standard barometer, barometer it detects pressure, it makes mercury move 760 millimeters. And we can, this is a, I'm not gonna elaborate on that because of time, but basically, Mercury expands and contracts with pressure very easily, and that can be calibrated, and you get 760 millimeters. And also, the same, basically the same unit, they're not identical, is the MMHG, which is millimeters of mercury, which is actually the unit, it's called MMHG, and then TOR. So in this class, we're going to consider them to be the same thing. But in the real world, they're a little bit different. I don't exactly know the conversion. It's like 1.002 something. TOR is an MMHG, and it's very close. Why do we have both units? Good question, I don't know. It's pretty stupid to me, but whatever. And then you have the Pascal. So the Pascal is the SI unit for pressure, but the number's pretty damn big. So one ATM is 101,325 Pascals. That's a kind of pain to work with all the time. So we don't really use Pascals, but it may come up in a question. So be aware of this conversion. And the conversion will be given to you. So you don't have, you don't have to memorize it. So just be aware that, that it exists. And also when it comes to equations, you'd have to know which one to use. But when we're talking about the ideal gas law, which is written down here, or which the, in which the, the variables are written down here, we don't need to worry about, or we do need to worry about the units. But in the other equations, we don't have to worry about the units too much, but a little bit. And here's what I mean by that. So volume, is we, we're gonna measure it in milliliters and liters. And the standard obviously we know is liters, but in some equations like Boyle's law, Charles's law, combined gas law, things like that, we can get away with liters. We can get away with milliliters as long as the left and the right side of the equations are the same. For the amount, and if we see the variable N, it's always gonna be number of moles. 
So just keep that in mind. Big one, temperature is always Kelvin, always. So if you see Celsius temperatures, many of the questions will give you Celsius temperatures. Your first thing, always convert them to Kelvin first, even before finishing reading the question, put them into Kelvin just so you don't forget. So for Boyle's law, Charles's law, Avogadro's law, and the combined gas law, like I mentioned, the volume units don't matter as long as they're the same on the left and the right of the equation. Because the way these equations are going to work is you're going to have a condition one, meaning a P1, a V1, and you're going to compare it to a P2 and a V2. As long as those ones and twos have the same unit, you're good. Temperature always has to be in Kelvin. The ideal gas law, when we get to that, which will be after these other laws, you'll see that there is a constant. This is called the ideal gas constant. R, R equals 0 0.08206, liter ATM per Kelvin mole. It should be per Kelvin mole. So this means that in our equation, we have to use these units. We have to use liter. We have to use ATM. We have to use Kelvin, and we have to use mole or else this constant holds no weight, it doesn't work. There are other constants of R, but we're gonna be using this one in this class and it will be given. So don't worry, and there are, I mean, you may be given the other one, but again, it's given. So the, the constant tells you what units you're gonna use. Okay, so let's just jump into the laws. So here's all of them basically. Um, and what we're gonna do is, there's actually one that we don't cover specifically and I, I added this chart is uh, Gay-Lussac's law, which is in the middle. But let's just go over them. So the first one's Boyle's law. Boyle's law, P1V1 equals P2V2. This basically means that if you have a piston and you have some gas in it, if you push down on the piston, you are going to be increasing the pressure, one thing, and then directly you're going to be decreasing the volume. Because if you're pushing down the piston, there's less space for the gas to move. So one goes up, the other one goes down. This is called direct proportionality and, or sorry, inverse proportionality and is dictated by that equation. And same thing, you've seen P1V1 equals P2V2 basically before, right? With M and V, M1V1 equals M2V2 for dilutions. Same thing, same concept. Okay, next one, Charles's law. So Charles's law is a direct proportionality between volume and temperature. And you notice in all these equations, you don't really have every variable accounted for. So such as Boyle's law doesn't include temperature. This means it's held constant. If you have a formula that doesn't have a variable in it, assume that variable is held constant. So, and it will, the questions will say that. The questions will, most of them will, if they're written correctly, they'll say, oh, if you have P1 and V1, and then you have P2, find V2, assuming constant moles and temperature. It'll tell you that, so don't freak out. I mean, that's, just, I'll just, that's just what it means when it tells you that. Okay, so Charles's law, if you have a certain amount of gas and you keep the pressure constant in that piston, and then you heat it, what's gonna happen to the gases? Will they get faster or slower when you heat them? Faster, right? More kinetic energy, or sorry, more, well, the temperature, the definition of temperature is the average kinetic energy of particles. So the more temperature, the more kinetic energy, directly proportional to each other, speed and, and temperature. So if that's the case, and you have these faster moving particles, and we wanna keep the pressure constant. If you keep the pressure, or if you keep the volume constant, these things, these, uh these molecules are gonna increase pressure because they're moving faster. But that's not what Charles's law is saying. Charles's law is saying that we're keeping the pressure constant. So what's gonna happen is, in order for that pressure to re-equilibrate, we re-equilibrate, re what's gonna happen is the volume will increase. So the temperature will increase, the gases will go faster, they will push more on the container, leading to an increased volume. The piston will start to expand. So that's proof that your temperature and your volume are directly proportional. One goes up, the other one goes up. So that is Charles's law. Third one is Gay-Lussac's law. So this is the same 
approach, but let's say in that same piston, you kept the volume constant. So we're like, nope, this piston, this piston can't move, but you have to heat it up, all right? So then you have no choice. These gas molecules, no matter how hard they push on the inside of that piston, it's not moving up because you fixed that piston. So the only remaining, remaining thing to happen is the pressure has to increase. And the pressure increases when you increase the temperature because the gas molecules start to move faster. So that's Gay-Lussac's law. So then you can combine these three laws into the combined gas law. Now the combined gas law is basically just all of them put combined, right? And it's not really much to explain after that, of that, but you can solve any of the Boyle's, Charles's law, Gay-Lussac's law questions with the combined gas law. All you'd have to do is assume that you have to know which one of those is constant and then cancel it out. Sometimes you may have five variables and they'll ask you to find the sixth one. In that case, you have to use combined gas law. So there's a plethora of questions that can be asked on this. But if you are smart and understand each law, you'll see them as basically just plug and chug, which I hope you do. And then the other one, which we'll cover after these four, or yeah, is the ideal gas law. Pivnert, PV equals NRT. Probably the most important one because you can solve every equation with it, every question with it. It may be a one, one more step, but you can definitely solve every question with it. And it involves moles. The other ones don't involve moles. There is Avogadro's law, which is another one, which for some reason in this textbook, they just omit. I think they omit it. Oh, they don't. Okay, good. So that's a good one. To, that's another one that's not on this list. Some lists omit it, omit it for some reason. Um, but regardless, we'll cover it. Okay. So we talked about Boyle's Law already. Now let's do, an, now this is an important example. Oh, first of all, before we go there, um, we'll talk about PV equals NRT after these four, as we do, do, after we do a couple of examples with it. But before that, is there any questions on these laws? Yes. Well, no. So let's say you have a gas in a closed container. You open the container. The room is a new container. So it can apply to gases in every situation, but we're just using pistons as a fixed, as a closed system example. Okay. So the Boyle's Law. Now here is a tough question. This is, on, this is a homework question that is difficult because you have to think outside of the box or outside of the cylinder, if you will. So let's read it. So a 50 liter cylinder containing helium gas at a pressure of 15 ATM is used to fill a weather balloon in order to lift equipment to the stratosphere. What is the maximum pressure that a 285 liter balloon can be filled? be filled. First things first, write down your variables. So we have, all right, a 50 liter cylinder. So V1 is going to be equal to 50. Pressure that it's at is 15.3 ATM. It used to fill the weather balloon in order to lift the equipment, blah, blah, blah. What is the maximum pressure in ATM that a 285 liter, so V2 equals 285, liter balloon be filled. So we're, we don't know pressure. Now here's the, here's the kicker with this one. It's not normal, this question. It's not, oh, you just plug in P1 and V1 and then V2 and solve for P2. It's not. Does anybody know why? Yeah. Is it because of the units? Not because of the units, but yeah, what were you gonna say? If you go into a warm system, one, okay, so, right, so what would that close? You, you're getting there, you're getting there. Any elaboration on that, or that's it for now? It will, it will, it'll affect the pressure. I'm glad you say that. I just wanna see what people online said. No, the balloon doesn't expand, good thought. Oh, and how, just to repeat that. Yeah, the R is the ideal gas constant. 
Um, Adi, so the temperature changes with altitude. No, good thought, but no. So just to save time, I'll tell you. Think about, and we didn't learn this, but how a cylinder works. So maybe you have, you have experience with propane gas canisters or different types of compressed air canisters. The way they work is they're pressurized. And that means the only re there's no electronics involved. There's no, there's no pump that's pumping the air out. They're just pressurized. That's why the air comes out naturally. The reason why the air comes out naturally is because the pressure gradient or the pressure differential between the high pressure inside the canister and the outside world is a very big gradient. So with a big gradient, what happens with any gradient, and maybe you know this about math or in physics, always the high moves to the low to make an equilibrium. That's what happens. The high pressure moves to the low pressure environment. So in this case, we have a high pressure cylinder, a pressurized canister. That pressure and that gas will move to the balloon. We know that. But to what point? So they will move, the, the gas will move to the balloon until not all the gas is gone from the, from the cylinder. They'll move until the pressures are equal. So they'll move until it's an equilibrium between the, the cylinder and the balloon. We can't have all of the gas leave the cylinder because otherwise it'll be a vacuum and then all the air will just go back in. So it has to reach an equilibrium. This is a very important concept. I am, I'm not sure if they'll throw a question like this on the exam, but they might. So keep in mind, whenever you're dealing with cylinders, if they're filling things up, know that not all the air is leaving the cylinder ever. It leaves until it reaches an equilibrium. So that leads up to the question of how the hell do we solve this? Now, the volume one is the same. It's going to be 50, no matter how you look at it. The pressure one is going to be 15.3, no matter how you look at it. This is where it gets interesting. So V2, you have to look at it in terms of state. So the second state of this is after you release the air from the cylinder to the balloon and it equilibrates. After it equilibrates, your total volume is not going to be 285 because that's just the balloon. What's your total volume going to be? If the gas equilibrates in the whole system, what would the total volume be in the system? Exactly, good, 285 plus 50, which is what, 335? I think so. So 335 liters would be the total volume, would be V2. Because the new system is gonna be the equilibrated pressure between the cylinder and the balloons, you have to add up those volumes. That's where the gas is residing. And then P2 is what we're trying to figure out. So is what pressure will that be? Will that equilibrium pressure be when the pressure is equilibrated from the cylinder and the balloon? So we can solve this, divide by 335, divide by 335, and 50 times 15.3. And we get 2.28. P2 equals 2.28 ATM. Now, does this make sense? Let's see. The pressure of the cylinder was 15. It was 50 liters. Now we're making it, we're basically expanding that gas times six about. So that means we basically approximately have to divide the pressure by six-ish. And that's about this, whatever, it's close enough. So logically that makes sense. Qualitatively, that's a good answer. And based on the math, it's also the correct answer. So, okay, any questions on that? Yes, yes. So a good question would be, professor, are all of them that hard? And the answer is no. So this is one is just for cylinders. When you have a pressurized cylinder unloading into another chamber of some sort. And we could do examples that are normal. We talked about Charles's law already. Here's one, here's Charles's law practice problem. 
Oh, a container holds 50 milliliters of nitrogen at 25 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 736 mmHg. What will be its volume if the temperature increases by 35 Celsius? Okay, so write down information immediately when you read it. So container holds 50 milliliters of nitrogen. Boom, 50 milliliters of nitrogen. Change my color. We'll use the rainbow. At 25 degrees Celsius, what do you do first? Change it to Kelvin, 298, boom. And a pressure of 736 mmHg. I have to write that down too. Because going into this problem, you don't know which law it is. Then, what will its volume be? So that means, ah, V2 is unknown. If the temperature increases by 35. So we would take 25 plus 35 plus 273. Means our new Kelvin temperature would be 333. And P2, they didn't say anything about the pressure. They just stated that it, this is the pressure doesn't change at all. So P2 is constant. We, can, we don't have to use it at all, but we can, we can write it down. So since you don't have to use pressure at all, we can use Charles's law. And that's going to be V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Or you could use the combined gas law and write P1 and, v, and, P1 and P2 and you will get the same thing. So if you do that, you'll get P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. And you'll see that since the pressure is constant, pressure will cancel out and you get Charles's law. So once you put that in, you're gonna put in 50 milliliters to V1, 298 into T1, unknown into V2, you just write V2, and then 333 into T2. You solve the math and you get 55.9 milliliters of N2. In this case, you can use milliliters because the unit will be the same on the left and the right. This one, most of them are going to be straightforward like this, but it's just important to mention that cylinder example because um, that's, a, that's a tougher one. So any question? Questions? No? All right. Okay. So the next law that we didn't really cover is Avogadro's law. So Avogadro's law states that the volume is directly proportional to the number of moles of gas. So this is saying that it's a direct proportionality, meaning that volume or V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. And that basically means, and so keep in mind, this is independent of gas, independent of what type of gas, because their size of the particles are so negligible. Now, this is saying that if you take a piston where the temperature and the pressure is constant, and you have a certain number of gas molecules in there, it's a certain volume. Great. If you pump more gas molecules in there, what's going to happen? The volume will increase, kind of like the balloon. The balloon will expand. So more moles, more balloon, or more volume of balloon. So that's basically Avogadro's law in action. OK, moving on. So here's the combined gas law. Now. Um, We'll talk about it and I'll give you five minutes to do some examples and then we'll keep going. Okay, so here's the ideal gas law. And the main thing that's different, it's PV equals NRT, Pivnert. It will be given on the exam. And if it's not, just know it. I, I Just to be faster with this stuff and in case you're worried about time, knowing things is helpful. Obviously knowing things is helpful, but uh, if you know some of like the key molar masses, some of the key equations, it'll save you time to look up and down, up and down, and it'll, you'll just be more on the ball. I and mean, you've less to worry about. So something like Pivnert and the combined gas law, very good things to know. Okay, so in PV equals NRT, we have to use the units that are associated with our ideal gas constant. And our ideal gas constant, most of the time is going to be 0.08206. The one that's written right there on the bottom right. But sometimes there's other ones. There's in thermodynamics, we use 8.314 when we use joules, but whatever. Most of the time we use this one because we're dealing with liter ATM. 
since one liter ATM is equal to a joule. So that's basically it. And with moles, I mean, if you're given mass, you can find moles, right? So there's different ways that this equation could be presented in a problem. And here are three of them. So maybe three. So um, I will give you until 6.55 to finish these three. I'll give you a rest from me talking. And I'll just tell you, I'll give you a hint on the first one. So you have 60 liters tank with this much temperature and this much pressure. When the leak was discovered, so it springs a leak. When the leak was discovered, the pressure was reduced to 50. How many moles of chlorine escaped? So we're looking for, all right, the, I would use two ideal gas laws. I would use the ideal gas law for state one when before the leak was, and then afterwards. So we can solve for that. So PV equals NRT, we'll do PV equals NRT. P1 is going to be 125. V1 is going to be 60. N is going to be unknown. R is 0 0.08206. NT is going to be 27 plus one plus 273, which is 300. And what do you get for this N? What was that again? 304.6. All right, so that's how many moles. It makes sense. It's a cylinder, it's gonna be a lot of moles. All right, so now there was a leak. So when the leak was discovered, the, the new pressure is now 50. All right, so we can figure that out. So how many moles of chlorine are now left? And then we can subtract the two and see how much escaped. So that's very important context of the question is how many escaped, not how many are left. So we can do another PV. So our new pressure is 50. Our new volume is still going to be 60 because even though there's a leak, the volume of the container is still the same. So it's going to be 60. Your new N is unknown. Your R is the same, 0 0.08206. And your T is the same as 300 because the temperature didn't change. They didn't say it did, so it did. So what is your, your new N2? Good job, Adi, 182, so 0.7, I'll say 183. So then 183 is gonna be the remaining gas moles. So what you can do is subtract the two, 183, and you're going to get, I think 181 is what Hal said. Yep, 182.8. Oh, so, oh, never mind. Um, Adi, yeah, 121. Yes. All right, so 121, that would be the amount of moles that escaped. So, all right, great job. Good. Does that make sense? All right, good. Yeah, this is, uh, that one's relatively difficult as well. There's two equations involved, two steps, three steps. Yeah. Would that work? I think it would. Yeah. So you could do another good job, Lewis. So what you can do is you could just you could subtract the pressures and then just plug that in there. And the difference in pressures would be the amount of gas difference. You could do that. That's actually better. But I'm again I think very simply. So it's like all right, we have a state one, a state two, let's see the differences between those two states. But for some of these, there are multiple ways to approach it. Yes, Alex. Oh, I'm off by decimals. Whatever. So wait, 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 wait. So for 183, you got 121? Oh, whoops. Maybe I'm wrong. So for the, for the 183 is 183, right? Can we have confirmation on that? Or... Did I switch these, the 121 and the 183? Anybody else do math? Okay, so I, yeah, they got, maybe you switched it. Maybe the math is wrong. Calculation error. It's all right. Okay, let's move on. So next one, you have, we'll just, eh, okay, we'll do all of them, screw it. So 96 grams of a gas occupies 48 liters, 
700 mmHg and 20 degrees Celsius. What is the molecular weight? And what is the gas most likely to be? So this one is another multi-step question. Now you have the molar mass, you have the volume, the pressure, which is not in ATM. So we have to convert it to ATM to use the ideal gas law. So to do that, it would be 700 divided by 760, because it's 760 mmHg in one ATM. And you get, what do you get for that? There's going to get 0.92, 0 0.92. So that's going to be our pressure. So we'll do 0 0.92 times 48 liters times N. Let's just put it N for now. We can modify N, but we don't have to do that right now. Times R, which is 0 0.08206 times your temperature, which is one, which is our 273 plus 20, which is 293. All right, so what do we get for N in this case? Anybody know? One, good job, how? 1.834. So N equals 1.84. Oh, I just said, yeah, 1.84, 1. 1. about. Okay, so, oh. Oh, from the conversion of 760 mmHg equals one ATM. Because we need to convert the pressure to ATM to use the ideal gas law constant. Right, so that's the conversion. Okay, so yeah, that'll be given on the exam, the conversion. Because yeah, the pressure is a different unit in this case. So, yeah, okay, so um, that's the moles. Now, we're given a grams of gas. So we can, we know something about moles and grams. We know a lot about it actually. So if we take in general, let's just talk in general. If you take the amount of grams of a sample and divide it by the number of, or sorry, and divide it by the molar mass, you get the moles of your sample. That's always true. So what do we have? We have the moles, we have the grams. So we can solve for the molar mass. Let's do that. So if we manipulate this equation, you would get the grams over the moles equals the molar mass. And that makes sense because molar mass is in grams per moles, grams per mole. And yes, um, Josh, so molecular weight is another word for molar mass. Okay, so we can divide grams, which is 96, by the moles, the so 96 divided by 1.84 to get our grams per mole. 96 divided by 1.84, that gives us 52. What the hell is a mass of 52? I don't know. The chromium. It's weird. Oh, I remember this. This had a, oh, the, oh yeah, I'm stupid. This. So this question, we did it right, but the answer gives us like a not, not a real answer. Chromium is not going to be a gas ever. It's a metal. So uh, technically it could. If you divide it by two, what do you get? You get uh, 27. And that's no diatomic gas is 27. So yeah, let's just say it's chromium gas, whatever. That's not a thing, but we could say that. But uh, regardless, the how we did the question, does that make sense? Okay. All right, next one we can do is this one. So you have 5.6 grams of solid CO2 put into an empty sealed four liter container at a temperature of 300 degrees Kelvin. When all the solid CO2 becomes gas or sublimates, that's a good word, what will be the pressure of the gas? All right, so right now initially, well, we have, we have all this stuff, we're looking for PV equals NRT right off the bat, we can find that because we're given an amount. So the pressure is unknown because we're being asked for the pressure. The volume is a four liter container, so 4.00. The N we can figure out because we have a grams and we have an identity. So we know it's 5.6 grams of CO2. So 5.6 divided 
divided by 44 is 0 0.13. So we have 0 0.13 moles times our R, which is 0 0.08206, times our temperature. Temperature is given to us in Kelvin. They did us a favor. It's 300. So now we can just take this quantity and divide it by 4 liters to come up with our pressure. So pressure equals 0 0.783 ATM. Yay. Cool. All right. Any questions on that one? That was a little bit easier. That, that's the kind of, that's what most of them are going to be like. They're not going to be crazy with five steps, but if you know the crazy ones, the easy ones will be super easy. So any questions? No? All right, cool. Let's move on. So here is a good chart set with all the formulas on there. So this is the, kind of the same chart we had before, but ignore the bottom part. Ignore this. Just ignore this completely. The volume is not going to be in, in decimeters cubed. Decimeter cubed is a liter, so I guess technically, yeah, it will be, but don't worry about that. Temperature is always in Kelvin, but I don't know why I got rid of that then. Temperature is always going to be in Kelvin. But don't worry about this. If it confuses you, don't worry about the decimeter crap and the kilopascal stuff. But the other things are true. Okay. So here's another slide talking about the units, the same slide we saw before. Uh, here's another example with the, the spring leaking. A week. We did this one. Well, the same kind of thing. Um, okay. So now let's talk about some things about gases. More things. Now, temperature and velocity. So instead of going through con conceptual stuff, I'll just tell you the cut to the chase. The smaller the gas molecule, the faster it goes. We the average kinetic energy. Kinetic energy, right? So if you look at physics, kinetic energy is one half mv squared. The average kinetic energy, and here it's basically the same thing, one half Na, which is Avogadro's number, times the mass of each molecule, uh, times the root mu squared velocity squared, meaning the average velocity squared, equals the average kinetic energy. Now, what this is saying is that <clears throat> it depends on the mass and it depends on the velocity. With something like a hydrogen gas, very small, low mass, high velocity. It's small, it's fast, it'll have a certain kinetic energy on average. Same thing for oxygen. It's well, but the op same kinetic energy, but the opposite uh, reason why. It's bigger and it's slower. So the mass will increase and the velocity will decrease. So what I'm trying to say is the mass and velocity of gas particles are inversely proportional. If the size of it goes up, the velocity goes down. That is why the kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy of all gases in, that are ideal, we call this the ideal gas law because we assume that there's I, this ideal gases, meaning they don't have any interaction with each other. Um, they have completely elastic collisions. Everything that was mentioned in the kinetic molecular theory of gases, we assume to be true. That's why we can call these things ideal, because it's the ideal condition. We're going to talk about later what happens when it's not ideal, but right now they're ideal. <clears throat> so ideal gases all have the same average kinetic energy at a certain temperature, because the temperature is the definition of kinetic energy. So does that make sense that they, all the gases, the bigger ones move slower, the slower ones move, or sorry, the smaller ones move faster. That's why the, all the kinetic energies are the same. They balance out. So very important thing. And you can calculate the root mean square velocity, so the average velocity of any gas molecule based on its molar mass and its temperature with this equation. This equation will be given as well, the root mean square velocity. And I think the homework has some questions on it. So the way it would work is square root of three times R times T. In this case, R is different. So in this case, R is the other R, 8.314. Because we're talking, because this R relates to kinetic energy, meaning joules. 
So since the R relates to joules, we're using this constant of joules per Kelvin mole. 8.314. And that constant will also be given to you. And then your temperature, again, always in Kelvin. And your this big M is the molar mass of your gas. So that makes sense how the temperature is in the numerator, meaning the faster, the higher temperature, the faster the velocity. And then the molar mass is in the denominator, meaning the bigger the molar mass, the slower the velocity. That makes sense. And that's just the equation for it. So any questions on that? Oh, U is root mean square velocity. So it's just it's the average velocity. So keep in mind, the most important takeaway from this, besides the equation, is gases all have the same average kinetic energy, but they have different average velocities based on their size. And here's an example of that. So you have the molecular speed versus the molar mass. Molecular speed, not kinetic energy. So you see something like hydrogen, where the average velocity is like here, like 1700. Meanwhile, oxygen is a lot bigger. Average velocity is down here, like 400. But you notice as you increase the speed or you decrease the size, there is a larger distribution of, of velocities. And this is because the more entropy you have, the more disorder you have in the molecules is usually caused by more speed. And then the more, the bigger a range you get of, of velocities. So the, the reason why you get a range is if you think about a container, and in, this is in layman, it gets more complicated than this, but in layman's terms, if you have a container, some gases are being pushed against the container. They're not moving too fast. They're being bombarded. Some molecules are in the middle moving really fast because they have a free, they have what we call a free mean path. So that means a free mean path of gases. That means how far that they have to move on average before they hit another particle. Sometimes that distance is very big. Sometimes it's very small. With molecules that generally move faster, like hydrogen and helium, that range of the, of the mean distance is a very large range in comparison to something like oxygen. So that's why you have a bigger disparity between the velocities of H2 compared to O2. But on average, the H2 ones do move a lot faster. All right. So um, we talked about that already, basically. Same thing. Uh, temperature versus molecular speed. So temperature also uh, determines it. If you have, obviously, if you go faster, you're increasing the entropy, you're increasing the distribution, but you're also increasing the average velocity. So there's examples here. This is N2. So N2 at zero degrees, it's moving pretty slow at less than 500 meters per second. At 1,000, it's moving about 700. And at 2,000 Kelvin, you're moving about 1,100 on average. So, so yeah, speed or the temperature increases it. So here would be an example. We're not going to go crazy with this example, but here's how it would work. Is, let's say you, you're asked to calculate the root mean square velocity of O2 at 25 degrees Celsius. So you're going to be using this root mean square equation. And you're going to... Put it in three times your R, and your R is 8.314 now because we're talking about energy. Temperature is going to be 298 Kelvin. And then your molar mass, this is where it gets a little bit different. So molar mass, because your constant is in joules, your molar mass has to be in kilograms. Weird, but I'll explain why. And also... To keep in mind, the constant will be given. So that'll help the, with the units. It'll help you if you get stuck. But basically, with R, a joule is equal to a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So it makes sense that kilogram has to be wherever we put in mass in the rest of the equation in order for a kilogram to cancel out. It has to cancel out with something. It's not canceling out with joules. So we need to end up with meters per second because it's a velocity. So in order for this to work out, our molar mass has to be 
in terms of kilograms per mole. So in that case, you multiply the molar mass by 10 to the negative third. And that's it. And that's the kilograms per mole. Does that make sense? I know there's a lot of little nuances to keep in mind, but the homework will definitely help. The practice will help. So just try your best. Okay. Good, good, good. All right. So one of the last things we're going to, one of the, it's kind of easy after this, but one thing we're going to talk about is diffusion and effusion. So what diffusion is, so if you have diffusion of gases, it basically means the movement of gases from a high concentration to a low concentration. Very similarly to how gases in a cylinder move from a high pressure to a low pressure. Same idea. But there's no equations really governing gas diffusion. I mean, there are, but, but not in this, we're not going to go over any in this class. The next one is effusion. So effusion, there is an equation that we do cover. So effusion is the process of which molecules of gases escape through a small, tiny hole in a vacuum. So the vacuum kind of pushes them through this hole. And this hole is very small. It's like we say a pinhole, but it's really like maybe a couple of atoms thick. So the size of the gas molecule and its velocity will take a part in how fast it moves through this hole. And why is it important to know about effusion? Because, I don't know, I never used it in my research, but um, when you're talking about vacuums and like maybe things more aerospace, things like this would become important because if you want to fill a certain... Of a fill a vacuum chamber with gas, and that's like a like a, if you're going from outer space to in the in the spaceship. This is all based on effusion. And you need to know what gases you're putting in, what's their effusion rate, how fast does the chamber fill up to atmospheric conditions, etc. So there is a lot of use for this in aerospace, among other things. But anyway, so here's the graphic of effusion. You have a little tiny pinhole. And the gases are getting sucked into a vacuum to kind of equilibrate that temperature. And the rate at which this happens is based on the identity of the gas and more specifically, the size of it. Now, here is the main equation. It's called Graham's Law. Graham's Law of Effusion states that the rate of, keep in mind, this is rate. So rate, in this case, is going to equal, let's say, molecules per second. So it says the rate of gas A over the rate of gas B, meaning the ratio of the rates, is equal to the square root of the molar mass of gas B divided by the molar mass of gas A. So let's do an example. Let's say we have gas A is hydrogen. H2. Let's say gas B is oxygen, O2. Let's see what happens. So you have rate A over rate B equals the square root of the molar mass of gas B. Molar mass of O2 is 32. Molar mass of A is 2. We calculate that. We get the square root of 2 times the square root of 16 divided by the square root of 2. The square root of 2 is cancel out. You get 4 over 1. What this means is that the way to it, it's important to interpret it, not only to figure it out, because that's what they're going to ask on the exam, maybe. So we know that rate one, rate A over rate B equals four. This means for every four molecules in one second that hydrogen goes through of, of hydrogen that go through that hole, only one molecule of oxygen will go through that hole. So the rate is four times the amount. One question they might ask is, how many molecules of oxygen will go through for every 20 molecules of hydrogen? In that case, you know that it's a four to one. So if it's 20 molecules of hydrogen, all right, so you multiply that by five, it would take five seconds for 20 molecules of hydrogen to go through, and it would only take five molecules of O2 because of that four to one ratio. So they could ask you kind of extrapolating questions like that after you figured out the ratio of the rates. 
Now keep in mind, it's a rate. It's not just a number, it is a rate. So molecule per second, for example. All right, does that make sense? You'd be able to do that? Okay, hopefully. All right, so moving on, next thing is standard condition. So I did mention this in the beginning, but basically what this is, is because gas size is negligible, meaning um, their, their size compared to the distance between the molecules, we can say that we can call a standard condition something, and then we can say one mole of a gas in that standard condition has certain features. So this standard condition, before we go on to those features, is STP, we call it. So STP, standard temperature pressure. And this STP means the standard pressure of one ATM and the standard temperature of zero degrees Celsius. This is important because STP will not be given on the exam. So I'm not gonna give you, or no, I'm not, but they're not gonna give you what STP means. They might say a certain gas at STP has X amount of moles, find something else using one of the ideal gas laws or using one of their laws. So it might just say ATP, uh, ATP, that's biology. It might, it, might say, it might say STP just to give you the pressure and temperature in less words to put into the equations. It was important for you guys to know what they mean, that STP is one ATM and seven, 273 Kelvin or zero Celsius. So that's important. Now what we can say is if we put in that standard condition into PV equals NRT, every single time you'll get this number, 22.4 liters. So it means that this sentence is perfect. One mole of any substance is on Avogadro's number of particles. The molar volume, meaning the volume of gas of the volume of one mole of gas particles at STP will always be 22.4 liters, assuming they're ideal. So the molar volume, that's what we mean by molar volume. Molar volume is the volume occupied by one mole of a substance of a gas substance at STP. It's always going to be 22.4. So you can use that to your benefit. You can, instead of wasting time calculating the 22.4, if they ask you, there is, what is the volume of seven moles of gas at STP? Or even if they don't tell you STP, they can be like, it can be sneaky. They can tell you, at, oh, pressure is one ATM and the temperature is zero degrees Celsius. What is the volume of 0.5 moles of it? You'd be like, ah, that's STP. If it's STP, one mole is 22.4. Half a mole is half of that, so 11.2. So you can use STP to your advantage to make you faster with the calculations. So um, in that, there, there's using STP in that chapter six worksheet that I put up on Canvas, and also the homework. So this is a good thing to know. Another thing is density. So density of a gas is the molar mass of the gas divided by the molar volume. So at STP, the molar volume is always 22.4. Depending on that gas, you could determine the density of it at a specific temperature or condition. So density is usually gram per liter. And this is just extrapolating on what we already know in terms of how to figure out the density of a gas. It's basically how much of the gas is there over what type of volume we're talking about. So for example, if you want to figure out the density of helium at STP, we take the molar mass, we divide it by the molar volume, and we get its density. Same thing for nitrogen, it would be a higher density because one mole of it will take up the same amount of space, but it's heavier, it's 28 grams per mole. So the resulting density will be almost double, or no, almost 10 times, or like seven times as much, or almost exactly seven times as much. But yeah, so does that make sense? So you can find out, this is just telling you more things. You can find out density. 
and you can come up with another uh, density equation, which I'm not going to go through the, the trouble of deriving, that density equals the pressure times the molar mass over RT. This one will not be given on the exam. Honestly, I would, if, you were, if you're crunched for time and studying, I wouldn't go through it too much. There may be a question on it, may not, but it won't be more than one if there is. And if there is, you could even derive it from, you could do a multi-step question on like using PV equals NRT to figure out the same answer. Oh, and um, how to answer your question, where did 22.4 came from? come from? The 22.4 is the volume of one mole of any ideal gas at STP, at the standard temperature pressure. That's just the definition, 22.4 liters as the molar volume at STP. And if it's not STP, it varies. So, so um, keep that in mind as well. And you have to use your laws to figure that out. Okay, moving on. All right, so if you have mixtures of gases, this is very easy, so we're gonna go over this briefly. If you have mixtures of gases, what you can do is you can add up their pressures to figure out the total pressure of your mixture. The air we breathe is a mixture of gases. And the pressures, the partial pressures of those gases add up to one ATM. So let's say we have a partial pressure of nitrogen. Partial, well, I think in the previous chart, here we go. So here's the air. So this is the percent by volume. And it's also the percent by partial pressure. And the percent by mole also. But regardless, now what we can do is we can say that, all right, the partial, if everything equals one ATM, since our atmosphere is one ATM, we can say that nitrogen gas is equal to 0 0.78 ATM. Oxygen gas is 0 0.2, 0 0.21 ATM. Argon is 0 0.9 ATM. Nope. 0. Point, this is percentages. So 0 0.09 ATM. No, 0 0.09. Two, rewrite that. 0 0.009 ATM. Plus carbon dioxide, which is 0 0.0004 ATM. And that equals 1 ATM. So what we're trying to say here is that this is called Dalton's law of partial pressures. And it basically, very simply, you add up the partial pressures, you get the total pressure. That's it. There it is. So you add up the partial pressures, you get the total pressures in any mixture of gas. What you can do for those gases is you can say that there are a bunch of PV equals NRTs for each gas. And you can figure out the number of moles of each gas from knowing the pressures. Because since these partial pressure gases are going to be in the same mixture, they have the same volume, the same temperature, and you can figure out their, the total number of moles too. So you can use PV equals NRT with the partial pressures, depending on what the question is asking for. So that's very vague, I know, but um, I'm not really stressing it too much for a reason. You're not going to really need to do anything about that. But something you will need to know is this idea of the mole fraction. So mole fraction is very similar to partial pressure. Because of the ideal gas nature of their molecules being so small, and they basically all take up the same amount of space at a certain condition, we can say that the fraction of moles is equal to the same fraction as their pressures. So for example, if you have 78% nitrogen by volume in the air, you also have 78% by moles in the air. So same thing for oxygen with 21%. Does that make sense? The pressure fraction, meaning the this, this thing. So the P pressure of gas A over the total pressure of the mixture is equal to the molar to the moles of gas A over the total moles in the mixture. So this pressure, this partial fraction, this molar fraction for nitrogen in, in the air would be 0 0.78. 
always. For the partial pressure percentage, it'd be 0.78 or 78%. So they're the same thing. So now how can we use this? If you're given the following information, let's say you're given that a sample of gas has a pressure of two ATM. What is the partial pressure of oxygen if the mole fraction is 0.2? So you'd say, all right, two ATM is the total pressure. So I'd put two right here. The partial pressure of oxygen is 0.2, like I just said, so it's right there. So you would do two times 0.2 equals 0.4. That's going to be the partial pressure of, of A. And you notice the partial pressure fraction is the same as the mole fraction, So, if we, but not the partial pressure. So partial pressure can be determined by the mole fraction. So the partial pressure is 0.4. But if you do the partial pressure fraction, did 0.4 divided by 2, you get 0 0.2, which is the same as the mole fraction. So yeah, any questions on that? Sorry if it's too many words. What does the X mean? That's mole fraction. Okay. Okay, so here's another example. So same thing with, we did this example just now with nitrogen, we talked through it. So the mole fraction is going to be the same as the partial pressure fraction and it could be used to multiply by the partial, uh, the, yeah, the pressure total to figure out the partial pressure of any of the components in the mixture. So here's a kind of example. To find the mole fractions of gases in a 12.5 liter tank with 24.2 grams of helium and 4.32 grams of oxygen at 298. Okay, so first, Find the mole fractions. Automatically, I think, all right, we have mole fractions we need to find, and we have the grams. So we can just figure out the moles off the bat and add them up. That's exactly it. So the number of moles of helium, you would take 24.2 grams divided by the molar mass of helium, which is about four, and you'd get around, you get 6.05. So you have 6.05 moles of helium in the sample. And then you the molar mass of O2 is 32. And you'd have the grams of O2 is 4.3. So 4.32 divided by 32 equals 0 0.135 moles of O2. So then what we can do is we can add these up and figure out the total number of moles. That total number of moles is here and it's here. And we can figure out the mole fraction of each of our components by taking the number of moles of each of our components, dividing it by the total number of moles, and coming up with our answers. So the mole fraction for helium would therefore be about 70, not 97, 98%. And for oxygen, it'll be about 2.2%. So does that make sense? Find the moles, forget the mole fraction. It could ask you, what's the partial pressures? Can it? I guess it can. Hmm, can it do that? Yes, it could totally ask you that. Yeah, so if it asked you, like, what's the total pressure? You could, it could definitely do that. So what you can do is, that's actually a really good, I'm glad I said that. Wait, but is, does it do that? Oh, it does. I didn't even know it did. It did that. Okay. So what if it asks you a follow-up of what's the total pressure? Now it says find the partial pressures. Many ways to approach this. What you can do is first you can use P total or PV equals NRT. And your P total would be the resultant of PV equals NRT where your N is the sum of all the moles. So all of your moles from the previous question, you had 6.185 moles. 
Then your R, we know the constant, our T would be the temperature, and our V would be the liters. Getting our pressure, getting our, um, sorry, our total pressure, that would give us something to go off of using our mole fractions. So our mole fractions can then be taken into account, multiply them by the total pressure to figure out the partial pressure for each of our components. So for helium, it would be 98% or 0.978 times your total pressure, giving you 11.8 ATM. And then for oxygen, it would be the 2% times our total pressure would give us our 0 0.264 ATM. So this question is very comprehensive. You can use PV equals NRT to find your total pressure with the total number of moles and then go into partial pressures. So does that make sense? Yeah, all right, cool. All right, moving on. Did that already? So now what we can do is we can kind of take everything and put it all together. So everything from chapter four and five, put it together with six. So we can use equations that have gases involved. And we can figure out using PV equals NRT and our knowledge of what we learned about the gas laws and STP to figure out things about chemical reactions involving gases. So in this question, how many grams of water form when 1.24 liters of H2 at STP completely react with O2? So we're using our knowledge of gases. We have our liters, our volume. We have our STP, which is our temperature and our pressure. And we don't have anything else. But what we can figure out from this, using PV equals NRT, we can figure out the moles. So if we figure out the moles of this gas, we could then use our balanced chemical reaction with our molar ratios to figure out how many, what's he asking for, how many grams of water? So we can figure out how many grams of water or by how many moles of water and then multiplying by the molar mass of water. So we can use stoichiometry and put that in with gases. So let's, this is a good one we should do together before we, we're almost done. So let's do this. So PV equals NRT, so our pressure, is going to be one ATM. Our volume is going to be 1.24 liters. Our N is unknown. Our R is zero, or yeah, not eight, 0 0.08. 0 0.08206 times our T, which is, what's T? Oh, it's STP, right? So what's T? Good, 273, awesome, 273. And then we can solve for N and we get a number. It's gonna be a number, it's not gonna be a letter, I'll tell you that. Divided by 0 0.08206 and we get 0 0.055. That's how many moles of hydrogen. So it tells you of hydrogen. Now, looking at the equation, we know that two moles of hydrogen react to produce two moles of water, meaning it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So this means that our 0 0.055 moles of H2 reacts to produce 0 0.55 moles of H2O. We can multiply that by the molar mass of H2O, which is 18, to come up with our answer, which is one gram, 0 0.996 about one gram. So cool. So kind of combining all the concepts. Is that good? Make sense? All right, cool. So we're almost done with chapter six. And then we'll take a break. So something that we've been talking about in this class so far is this thing called the ideal gas. Oh, if we assume, like, uh, who's in mechanics right now for physics? Well, a lot of you are in physics one. Yeah, like some of you, okay, well, something they say in the questions, um, assume it's a frictionless, massless pulley with a frictionless, massless wheel, whatever. And it's like they assume like all this wrong crap that you assume, but that's to make the question a lot easier. Uh, so my roommate who's a, or my ex-roommate, who's a physics, he's a physicist, he took like the uh, grad classes for physics and he's like, 
imagine that if you didn't have a frictionless massless pulley. Those are the questions that he did. So it's an incredible amount of calculations, but I diverge. Now, that's what we were doing with ideal gas laws. We were assuming this frictionless massless elastic collisions and all this stuff. Now, this is mostly true for low pressures. So this is the molar volume of some of the, of the gases, right? They're not exactly 22.4. This is at room temperature, I believe. Yeah, so, um, or this is not room temperature, my bad. This is at STP. Um, but they're, they're about 22.4, a little bit off, but on average, they're 22.4. Now, the ideal gas law, the ideal gas uh, idea falls apart when we go to extremely low temperatures or extremely high pressures. So is there a graph for it? Some of them are pretty good. Like argon is really good. So here's the red line represents ideal gas behavior and the green line represents argon. So what happens is argon doesn't really diverge from that curve too much, even if you're going to a thousand ATM. So it is what is expected, but there's other ones, are they shown here? No, they're not. Uh, there's other ones that like, I'll draw on this chart, like nitrogen, for example, at, when it goes above like 100 or maybe it goes above like 50 ATM, it goes crazy, it goes like that. It's not even close to ideal gas behavior. And keep in mind, this is 1,000 ATM. That's 1,000 times the pressure we're feeling now. We'd be pancakes, we'd be smushed. So yeah, keep that in mind, that pressure is dangerous. But anyway, how do we account for this? There is a modification to PV equals NRT called the real gas law. Not really, but it's called the real gas modification or called the Van der Waals equation. So here it is. It's basically PV equals NRT, but we're modifying P by adding a factor and we're modifying V by subtracting a factor or adding a factor, however you want to look at it. So here it is. It's a correct. It's a correction. Now the pressure. Now this constant A is dependent on the gas. And N and V, we know those variables already. And this is basically a correction for the intermolecular forces, meaning they're not completely elastic collisions. They do interact a little bit. This is a correction for that. Some gases interact more than others, so A has its own constant for certain gases. Same thing with B, but it corrects for the particle's volume. So if you're comparing hydrogen to, to like a, to carbon tetrachloride, for example, right? Carbon tetrachloride is huge compared to helium. So its volume will be significant compared to helium. So that's why if you look at the volume per mole, the, the B constant, for helium it's 0 0.02. For CCL4, it's 0.13, so it's a lot more. Um, but anyway, these constants kind of modify the equation. Now, how do you guys need to use these in the, in the, uh, on the test? You probably won't, but if you do, you'll be given the Van der Waals equation and the constants. So just letting you know this exists and every other variable you know. So even with the corrections, it's A and B, but you also have N and V, and just in case you have N in there, so those are just the moles, and you know how to you know how to figure that out. Oh, here's the chart I was looking for. There it is. So here's ideal gas behavior. Oh, nitrogen's not here, but still, you get the idea where you have helium, for example. So ideal gas behavior would have this constant nature across high pressures, but then you have 800 ATM, crazy high pressures. You have helium, doesn't even, it's like, nope, not even close. Anything above, like, five to 10 ATM, I'm out. Same thing with most of them. So the ideal gas behavior is only ideal for very low pressures that we observe one to five ATM. And then it kind of gets out of whack. 